Hello and welcome to Salem Voices. I'm Lucy Rose, your host, and I am honestly excited beyond belief and rather overwhelmed to introduce you to our special guest today from the Salem College class of 1997, a chemistry major who graduated cum laude, which means she's already way separated from her host today, <laughs> Oyinda Oyalaren. <laughs> Oyinda has joined us today from her home in Boston. Welcome, Oyinda. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Lucy. Are you kidding me? Thank you. And I actually, she just got brand new glasses. So before we got started, <laughs> complimenting her on her glasses. So especially welcome. You're looking great or cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't wait. Honestly, I can't wait. And I know everybody else is going to be fascinated by your incredible story. Honestly, from being a senior at Salem to getting a PhD in chemistry from Harvard, that in and of itself is amazing to me to doing a postdoctoral fellowship at NIH, to several prestigious teaching positions, to your current position as a teaching professor at Northeastern. Whoa, what an impact already you've made on your journey. And I, I frankly, I don't even know where to begin, honestly. I don't remember ever seeing more honors and awards and service. I think you've served on every committee at Northeastern. Um, so here's what I'd love to do. If you'll just fill us in on that journey in five minutes or less, that in and of itself should be the challenge of your day. I'd love to hear it. Yes, good as yes, that, 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 <laughs> that is definitely a challenge, but um, okay. uh, I, I can do it. Uh, so my Somewhere journey. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from Salem, uh, my mm -hmm. first stop was at Merck Research Labs in New Jersey. Um, and then next stop was graduate school at Harvard, as you mentioned before. Um, after that was a slight detour outside of the sciences, which we could talk about that. Um, and um, after that was my postdoctoral fellowship at the NIH, the National Cancer Institute to be specific. And next stop was Williams College um, as an assistant professor. And now I am at Northeastern as a teaching professor. So. Look at you. Okay, well, that's not fair because that was way under five minutes. <laughs> yeah. The good news is by Thanks doing so that, I know we can now dig deeper into each one of those. So you're not off the hook with telling us about all about these. So okay. right. <laughs> when you first left, you went to Merck. I know Merck well. Um, you did research there for Merck for what, a couple of years, I think, before you started your PhD? Two years. Two years, yeah. Um, how did you get that first job? And did you like it? What did you do? And what made you decide to leave to pursue your PhD? Okay, um, so I, when I was at Salem, I got a scholarship, um, the UNCF Merck scholarship. Um, that was my junior year. And as part of the, um, the award was, was uh, a summer internship at Merck. So all, all, all scholarship recipients um, got to work intern at Merck and you have to actually had to commit for two, two summers. So summer after your junior year and summer after your, your senior year. Yeah. So my first intro to Merck was the summer after my junior year, for, just for a summer internship. And I just loved that experience so much. I mean, it was so much fun. Um, learned a lot, um, first introduction to the pharmaceutical industry. And so when I was leaving Salem, um, and mind you, I had that second commitment right. Right, to intern after my senior year, I just thought, why don't I turn this into a longer term thing? And, and because I just, I, I was thinking about sort of taking a break anyway after college. And, um, and so that was, that was sort of my path to staying on at Merck uh, for two years. So why did I leave? Yeah. Um, I, I, I always planned to leave. My, my intention was not to work at Merck forever. Okay. Um, it, it really, and it was clear. Um, I made that clear to okay. everyone, even during the hiring process that okay. I am not staying here long. I'm going on to graduate school. Um, so I always had an intention of going on to graduate school, but you know, I, I wanted some time to think about it a bit and just to try something else, live a little, as they say. Little, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, okay. uh, um, and then I went on to graduate school. Okay, did you always have in your mind, why did you want to go to graduate school? Just for the, I mean, you may have wanted a PhD, but did you already have in mind you wanted to teach or did you think you wanted to be a researcher full-time at that stage in your life? I thought I was going to, so I, again, I loved Merck. I loved, you know, just the idea of research and, you know, drug development and making drugs and helping people, you know, you know, everybody comes to work at Merck 
saying today I'm going to make a drug, right? right? Very few people do it, but um, so that drive, right? Because that's what gets you up in the morning. Say today I'm going to make something that's going to help somebody. Um, so that's what I thought I was going to do um, after graduate school was to, you know, go learn as much as I can and you know be be as um, uh, knowledgeable in medicinal chemistry as I saw my supervisor and you know all the other PhD scientists were. And um, so, so that was that was my plan. It was not teaching. Teaching was, was not, not in the plan so at all. Extraordinaire person that you are was not already kind of noodling in your brain at that point. That was that's no. interesting. Not at all. I mean, not at all. In fact, if somebody had told me that you know eventually you, you're going to end up teaching, I would have said no way. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, not me. <laughs> Outstanding. All right. So when you set your sights though on going to grad school, it wasn't just any grad school. You said, I'm going to Harvard. How did that happen? Now you're two years out of college. So your professors are no longer kind of a part of your normal life. How in the heck did you get into Harvard? How did that work? <laughs> well, you have to talk to <laughs> Harvard about that. To to it too. How did you do that? <laughs> um, well, my, my professors at Salem were, were still part of my life. Um, okay. And are still, I should say are still. Very good. Great. Outstanding. Um, great. But, but, you know, with the combination of their advice and um, mentors at Merck, who I spoke to about going to graduate school in organic chemistry, how, I want to make sure I do this right. What's the best, what's the best path to take to make yeah. sure that I place myself um, in a position that I can essentially do what you do, <laughs> right? Which is what I asked them. Um, and so with their advice, you know, they said, okay, here are the schools you apply to go for it. And I said, okay. So and Harvard um, just happened to be on the list. So you apply. Harvard was on the list. So I it was I didn't set out to to go to Harvard, right? I didn't say I must go. I mean, I, I think I had seven schools or something. Okay. Um Harvard was one of them. And I said, yeah, well, whichever one works out, we'll go. <laughs> right, so. okay, well, Harvard was smart and they chose you. Uh, for whom you are and in fact you're a Salem graduate I'm sure played into that really strong no but actually when you were about that same time we did have a number of people in Harvard around that time and shortly thereafter in different areas which is interesting yeah. several of the people I've interviewed have graduate degrees from Harvard so oh, fascinating yeah. um, but congratulations now what did you study when you were there what were you researching when you were there and just for folks listening how long a process was that for you to get a PhD um, so my focus was synthetic organic chemistry, which is making stuff in organic chemistry, making compounds. Um, my project specifically focused on making a natural product. And the idea there is not to, it's kind of making it for making its sake, but making it to learn something about the chemistry. And if you make it um, and it ends up having some interest in biological activity, great. That's sort of tangential. Uh, but really, it, it was about the process, you know, learning how to build molecules so that then, you know, if you decide to go back to industry, you can build any molecule. Sure. Um, so that was the that was the goal of my of my um, of my research. I, I worked on two of those natural products. How long did it take me? Five and a half years. It's a long, arduous process, isn't it? It, it was. Whoa. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations to you um, and, and just really you. well done. That's just thank you. exceedingly impressive. All right, so, but now talk about twists and turns. You introduced this when you started at the beginning. You left this amazingly prestigious program, now fully blessed with a PhD, and you said, I think I'll go to work for a law firm. Right. <laughs> talk about a twist and turn. Yes. <laughs> I have to dig a little deeper um, because you set it up. What happened? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, what was that about? That's a good question. <laughs> so, it's like a unicorn on your bio, you know, as I read your yeah, bio. Yeah, coming out, I think coming out of graduate school, as I, as I, as, as the years went on in graduate school, I really started to think about um, my interests again. And uh, gradually, I started to lose interest in going back to industry, right? Um, which was a problem because I thought, uh oh, <laughs> now know, what do I do? <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. Um, so, and so, so yes, yeah, so I didn't want to do that, and I definitely didn't want to go into academia. Okay, <laughs> so okay, hmm. right. So <laughs> now what? Right? What I mean, 
you know, and I didn't want to, I, I sort of wanted to stay in touch with science, but not kind of be in the lab. I think the process of being in graduate school sort of made me think, oh, being in lab is, is just tedious, right? And I was just longing to get away from that. Um, and so at the time, coincidentally, a lot of my peers were thinking the same thing. So it, this was sort of a, um, a wave in the department. Um, and I don't think it was anything new. Um, it's not unusual for consulting firms um, to recruit in the chemistry department um, at Harvard. And so I knew, I knew people who had taken a different path, right? Um, and so this was, but consulting was not for me either. Right? Uh, and so, so, so law, intellectual property law, which means, you know, I get to kind of think about science, you know, write about science and not really do it. So be in touch with cutting edge yeah. work, right? Yeah. Um, and, and not, you know, again, not be in the lab myself. So, so that, that's, that's what drew me to going into law. How can that um, Why not? Exactly. I said, why not? Right? That sounds fun. <laughs> right? um, I spoke to people who had taken the same path from PhD chemistry to law, um, got their advice, and I thought, that sounds like something I'd want to try out. And I did. And you did for one year, right? For one year. Okay, and so because then- Because when I got there, I realized, oh, I don't like this. <laughs> and what I didn't like about it um, was it took me too far away from um, science, right? It's 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 the law, right? So it, you know you're working at a law firm, and you know in 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 in, in the legal world, and, and apologies to to people who are in law here, it, 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 you sort of have to go with benefit of the doubt, right? So is best argument wins, right? Science it doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? No ma'am. Um, generally. And so I, I just, I was not comfortable with that Your science myself. Like um, and this was not an issue of ethics. This was just yeah. personal. Yeah. Um, um, and so I, I, I realized that I couldn't do that long-term. Um, and so very shortly after I started working at the law firm, I decided, you know, I need to go back to science re to lab <laughs> to the lab. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> I need rescue. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> So you left shortly there after and went to NIH yes. for a postdoc, I think, right? Which is just really cool that you did. And you were looking at biomarkers of prostate yes. cancer. Is that what I remember? Prostate okay. cancer, yes. Okay. Yes. Why don't you tell folks even what a biomarker is? Because I think that's interesting when you introduce a new term and you're a teacher, so why not? Yeah. Great. Um, a biomarker is, a, is an entity. So it could be a protein. It could be a small molecule that tells you, gives you information about what's going on in a biological system. Okay. Sort of a readout, okay? Um, and so what we, the, 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 the premise of my project during my postdoctoral work was um, looking at what are called um, antibodies, we kind of all heard about antibodies nowadays, um, antibodies to tumor associated carbohydrate antigens, right? And I'll explain sort of why we we're looking at those. Okay. Um, when cells undergo, when normal cells undergo transformation to cancer cells, a bunch of changes happen, right? So uh, physical changes on the cell that say, oh, this is now a cancer cell. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these changes are not recognizable to the body. And so the body doesn't send out a signal that says something's wrong um, because a lot of the changes are to normal proteins. They're always there anyway. Yeah. With the exception of what are called tumor associated carbohydrate antigens that spring up when a normal cell turns into a cancer cell. And for those um, antigens, the body does mount an immune, immune response because it says that's not normal, <laughs> right? right. Um, and it happens early in the process. And so the, the premise of, of my entire project was to uh, develop a system to um, detect, so to use as biomarkers, these antibodies to the tumor associated antigen so that you can actually read like an early, early, warning. early warning sign. Yes. So this yes. was designed, uh, for example, for screening. So prostate cancer, so the, the application of prostate cancer was to get around this issue of um, unnecessary treatment, right? Where 
you know, people go through screening and you find something, oh, you know, that doesn't look normal, but it's, it's, it's really, it's not a sign of cancer. Um, and so the, the, the technology that I developed during my postdoc was to use a panel of biomarkers. So not just one, because you get, you, you, you get better information where you're not looking for just one thing, right? When you get five signals tell you that, hey, something's wrong. Um, so, so that was, that was the project. It is so fun listening to you. You can see why perhaps you made the next decision in your life, which is after all of this, somehow or another, you said, I think I want to be a teacher, I think, right? Uh -huh. Yes. I mean, first, congratulations on what you did for prostate cancer, because it is amazing when you look, there's a, another test that folks may have heard of, they're listening, called PSA, the test yes. is not as specific as we might like, and That's right. there are lots of issues there, so you advanced our knowledge yes. of prostate cancer and the treatment thereof from watchful waiting and PSA to other things. So, you know, what you've done for us just in terms of impact or our husbands or brothers or whomever is fabulous. So kudos for that and thank you. And by the way, you have a lot of research published on what you found as well. So congratulations on that, which makes me really proud to be your Salem thank sister. You. <laughs> But you said, the heck with all of this stuff. I really don't want to be a researcher. <laughs> I really want to do something else. And you said, I want to be a teacher. How did you decide that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't as, as drastic as a, a, a switch as that. It was sort of gradual. So my, my, my move to teaching was more gradual. What, coming out of my, post, uh, of my postdoc, what I, what I thought was, I like research. I actually do like research and I want to do it. Um, but I also want to teach, right? So I want to... I, I kind of want to focus on, and I really was sure that I wanted to focus at the undergraduate level um, because, you know, my experience as an undergrad was just so pivotal in shaping my path. Um, and that's where I thought I could make the most impact and just sort of what kind of research I wanted to do, what kind of environment I wanted to be in. Um, so, so I did want to stay in research. So when I, when I went to Williams um, and, and, and um, <laughs> during my postdoc, I had, um, there was an undergraduate uh, student who worked with me over a summer. Um, and that was the first time I'd actually worked with an undergrad cr closely, one-on-one -on -one and not just somebody just kind of sort of in the lab, right? So we worked on a project. We actually have a publication, you know, his, his name is on one of the publications that came out of our project. Um, but that experience was just so eye-opening because the process of teaching, um, showing the students sort of what was going on, explaining what to do, and then seeing him sort of take off, right? And, and by the end of the summer, you know, he's on a publication, right? Um, so I, I really did enjoy that process. And that, that's actually what got, got me to, to start thinking, huh, okay, I, maybe I could do this teaching thing, <laughs> right? Um, um, and so, and so, so my first, my first um, academic appointment was my goal, my goal, right, was to combine teaching and research. Okay. And then, um, gradually, um, I, I, I started to reevaluate again. Um, so when I, when I made the decision to, to look for a different position um, after being at Williams for about a year, a year and a half, um, I thought, and, and, and let me just say that, that, that the experience at Williams was fantastic, right? So it's a great institution. Um, it, it, you know, the resources there are amazing. But this was more of a personal thing. I, I really did have to think about what drives me. Um, and, I, and I did think about that. Um, and I started to think, okay, teaching and research, which I was doing at Williams. I had a research lab. I had undergraduates in the lab. We were working hard on um, figuring out, you know, the link between um, severe malaria and carbohydrate antigen. So back to the carbohydrate thing. I had Andrew. <laughs> right. um, so we were doing research. But, but I just started to think, you know, I enjoyed preparing for lecture. I enjoyed going to class. I enjoyed teaching. I, I enjoyed doing that much more than sort of, you know, running the research lab. And that's what got me to start thinking, you know, maybe I should pick teaching aside <laughs> and really focus on what, what I was truly passionate about. Right. So my enthusiasm for both sides was not equal. I knew that. Um, 
And could I have done it? Sure. But, you know, I really did want to focus on one side. So, and then, you know, I, 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 for other reasons, I was also just thinking of going somewhere else. And so I thought, okay, if I'm going to go somewhere else, yeah. I'm only going to go somewhere where I could focus on what I want, exactly what I wanted to do, which was teaching. All I know is I want to take, if it weren't organic chemistry that you taught, I would want to take any other course that you teach, okay? And maybe <laughs> organic chemistry, because you're drawing me in so much, I'm finding myself almost, <laughs> almost eyeball to eyeball with the computer. The way you teach, the way your face lights up, I, I just, it's amazing. And clearly I'm not the only one to notice that because I'm gonna take a quick brag break for you right now, okay? You have been awarded recently the College of Science and the whole university teaching of excellence awards. No wonder other people are seeing something in you just like I am when you teach. What in the world is it? What do you think it is about you and your style that inspires people to feel the way they do to select you for that? What traits do you have that do that? Because it's phenomenal. I'm sorry, I can't help it. You have to self accept here just for Thank me. you, thank you. That's that's what that's that's really. That what do they tell you? <laughs> Why don't I do it that way? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know exactly. But but you know, if, if I could, I, I'm just going to talk about what drives me, right? Why and don't maybe you talk that's about what, what drives me. Great, right? Um, I ask a lot of my students. I really do, right? And I push them. Okay, but. I also make sure I help them meet the challenge, right? Um, so we're in, and I tell them, and I, and I actually say this um, explicitly, we're in this together, right? So the bar is high, but I'm here with you. Um, so, so I don't know, maybe that's part of it. Um, and I also really um, think it's important to see individuals. I care about my students as people. Um, so I, I mean, it's not uncommon for me to email individual students, many of them, <laughs> right, to come and talk to me um, about whatever, or just, you know, follow up and, you know, invite them to come chat about whatever they want to talk about in my office. So, so that sense of seeing people as people and listening to them um, and, and helping them, kind of reassuring them that even though, especially if it's organic chemistry, right? This is organic chemistry, it may be difficult, but it's doable, I'm here with you. <laughs> so well, that's I, what drives me. <laughs> I can really see that. And you already have my email address and now I'm afraid about all the emails I'm gonna get. Come see, <laughs> I'll take the train up and we can do this and we'll be there, okay? No. Really and truly, I can see that in you. What a, what a beautiful, empathetic, caring person you are. But what I really love is the fact you said, and I drive them. I expect a lot. And, and that says it all, doesn't it? I think that expectation and them then being able to meet your expectation. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's really rewarding. I, yeah. yeah. I, um, I recently got an email from a, a former student of mine who is now a graduate school um, at Duke, and he's you know just emailed to tell me, oh you know I'm I'm here now I'm in a lab I'm doing organic chemistry, um, and he just impacted and said you know I was so scared that first that first semester in your class, and, you know and I it, it was funny because I said I you didn't seem scared right but he said you know you you really you really helped me and, and, and so it's it's those kinds of connections. Um, and I went and I've and I've seen that time and again um, with students as they mature scientifically and just go out on their own and they kind of find that path. Um, and this thing that used to be, you know, for some for some people terrifying is now something they love. Right. Um, so so that's that's sort of part of it. And, and selfishly, I have to keep learning. I, I keep I have to keep learning. And that's great. <laughs> so. It is great. I think you were blessed with that um, gift of curiosity, just by listening yes. to you and watching your eyes move as we talk. Um, so I can see that as you go. And I, it leads me to, there, there's so many things I wish we had time to talk about. So maybe we'll extend this one for hours um, because they're, it's just fun talking with you. But as I think about this, 
I think about women in science and women in okay. chemistry. And I know that at least I think when you were at Williams, you were a part of a women and gender studies advisory committee even. Um, how, how are you feeling these days about women in chemistry, especially in leadership roles or in first authors of the research papers or any of that? Where, where are we with that? And are you concerned at all about women in leadership in, in science, but chemistry in particular? Yeah. Um... Where are we? We are making progress. So first I'll say the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to right? So two women, so, um, so that's great. Uh, so, so we're making progress um, on, a, on a larger scale. You know, when we, when we kind of zoom in and, and look on the ground, um, there is room for improvement, um, I think. And, and I think it starts early, right? Um, there are, you know, we talk about the, the leaky pipeline and, and where the leaks are. And I, I definitely see that pipeline leak it, through my classes, it definitely from, you know, the transition from undergraduates to whatever is next, okay. right? Um, and I'm not sure why that is, you know, I, I don't know whether we're not doing enough to encourage women to, um, you know, persist, right, or I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I, but I think there's still, there's a, there's, there's a significant, the, the attrition rate is still uncomfortably high, <laughs> um, when, you know, going from undergraduate to, to Again, whatever is next, whether that's work, whether that's graduate school um, for women. So, so there is room for improvement um, with mentoring. With um, there's just so many, there's so many little things, and you think you know when you when you hear it and when you see, it, you know, oh, right, we still need to make progress with that. Um, but I think things things are good generally. Um, things are getting better, but again, as I look. You know, I'll say again, there's room for improvement. Um, yeah. And you do a lot of mentoring yourself, I know. I do. Um, again, if you take 30 seconds even and glance at your bio, you can see all you give back. And some of that is actually more formal mentoring even with very specific programs. Um, back to Harvard even. The Society of um, Black Scientists and Engineers, I think, is one of your areas you really work in. Now, how effective is mentoring in your mind? And were you have you been impacted along the way by mentoring? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my, uh, you know, mentoring is so critical mm -hmm. um, in 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 every field, but especially in the sciences. And you know, and I'll just say this: it it kind of doesn't matter, you know, what vessel your mentor comes in. Mm -hmm. um, because you know the, the key is somebody who is there for you, you know, who is there and who will be um, critical when needed and will cheer you on when needed <laughs> when needed. Ah. Um, but but somebody you can trust that whichever way that goes, that they are in your corner. So it's very, I think it's very, very important. And and men mentoring has impacted my path. You know, just so intensely. Um, there are uh, the various stops along my journey. I can point to specific people who were pivotal in, you know, me taking that path and, you know, who just maybe just said something. And, and, and some of these, um, you know, mentoring doesn't have to be a grand thing, right? So maybe it's just, oh, this person I talked to and they said, I think I hear what you're saying. You know, have you considered this, right? And, and, that changes your life, right? Um, Aren't you struck often by how much you may impact others in times where you have no idea you've made an impact at all and vice versa, where absolutely. you are struck and go, whoa, did they just say that? And maybe the next day or the next week, it kind of sinks in and they weren't, it wasn't an official mentoring thing at all. It's just the impact we have to make opportunities for everybody. It's amazing. Absolutely. Just the conversation. Right? Just a conversation. Uh, conversation, right? Wow. And back to seeing people, right? This person heard what I was saying, yeah. right? And, you know, and they responded, right? Something came of it, exactly. Something came of it. Okay, you're a leader. 
in every way, as I say, um, I wish everybody could see your complete bio because um, it's really remarkable. And even that, of course, doesn't tell the stories. It just lists the dates and things. And But it's remarkable. You've been a leader in all you've done. I mean, honestly, I wish I could list all your awards and all the committees you've served on and everybody you've helped through the years. Um, if you could think about leadership, what are the biggest lessons you've learned about leadership and how also, as we begin to think about transitioning to your time at Salem, how do you think Salem prepared you to have those tools to be the leader that you are? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, well, I think, I don't, I was having a conversation about leadership with somebody and, and I, I remember say, you know, what I said in that conversation and that was, you know, people don't say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a leader. Like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right? no, they should, but they don't. <laughs> right. You know, it, it, it kind of happens. And, and, and what are some of the things that kind of drives you there? Well, maybe it's seeing a problem, right? There's a problem or there's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, and hey, nobody's either nobody's doing it or, you know, not fast enough or to your liking or whatever. Um, and hey, if, if, if that's not happening, step up, right? And, um, you know, the, some of the key lessons that I've learned, right, in, in the, the positions and, and all the service I've done is um, it's very important to, to bring people along with you, right? And to, to ensure that people ex accept that the problem or the issue is significant, right? And that comes down to communication. Right? Yeah. So you have to be able to communicate clearly, um, you know, maybe what's termed code switching, right? So switch from science science lingo to, you know, everyday right. language, right? So um, more television. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely, right. Um, it's important to, to, to listen. Um, people want to be heard. Everybody just wants to be heard, right? Just listen to people. Um, and um, I've learned that it's also important to learn from success stories. And I'm not saying to copy others, right, yeah. necessarily, um, or, or not, you know, wholesale, but explore and talk to people who've done it, right? Um, you know, there's, there's just so many paths that we think are new that, frankly, may not be, right? Yep. <laughs> right? Um, so, so that's, that's sort of what I've learned and, and, you know, Salem kind of started to open my eyes to the possibility of, um, stepping into leadership roles and that what I felt was coming out of Salem, no limits, you can do whatever you want. Right. <laughs> so, okay. Um, well, because I saw my peers doing a lot of things and, you yeah, know, yeah. professors and, you know, so I'm like, okay, you know, I can, yeah, I can do that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and right, if, if nobody's doing it, I'll do it. Okay. Why not? <laughs> right. Why not? So, That's one of my favorite sayings. I love that. Yes. Why not? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask why not. Here it is. You, you again, you have one, and we're going to come back to Salem momentarily. But you lead a very busy life, and you're, you've taken a little bit of time off, I think, this fall to do some things. Yes. So I asked you, what do you really love doing? What do you do when you're not doing that chemistry thing? And you named four different things. So I'm just going to kind of throw out a couple. A, you love to cook. You love to run. You love to sew. Uh, and you love to read. Did I get that right? I think so. All right. So yes. You, go. you don't just run, though. Okay, you <laughs> five marathons. Okay, so I don't think you do anything halfway. That's just my take on everything about you. Okay, but <laughs> what an accomplishment. What did you learn from all that training and stuff that you're a crazy woman? And beyond that, what? You know, why did you do that? What drove you? And do you have a favorite place you've done a marathon? <laughs> yeah, okay. So I uh, said the favorite place was Chicago. Okay, okay. so um, it's a huge marathon. It's just, it's a party. It's like a weekend. It's, it's great. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what 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 did I learn from the process? Yeah, training for a merit. So what I learned, the big takeaway is, with many things, it's it's more. Sometimes it can be more about the journey, maybe even more about the journey than the destination, right? So, the, a marathon is twenty six point two miles on the day of the marathon. Right, <laughs> that is but, correct. 
but leading, so you, but, but I mean, I don't think anybody can just run it. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to do a marathon today. You have to train for it, right? And so the hundreds of miles that, and the time that you put in um, determines what happens on during the 26.2 miles that day. That's right. right? So, so a big lesson for me is, and, and, and the key is, you know, again, as I said, the, the marathon itself is a party, right? The, the, the toiling, the training, you don't have a cheering squad. Nobody's cheering for you. So nobody sees sort of the work that you've done, right? Now they see, oh, you know, you're going to come out and do 26.2 miles and, you know, there's it's band and there's music and there's, you know, 100,000, 200,000 people cheering for you. <laughs> uh, but nobody's there when you're doing the, you know, 17 mile runs on a Saturday and the 20 mile runs on a Saturday and that. So, 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 so the big lesson for me is sometimes the background work that you have, you have to do all of that where you don't have a cheering squad, right. To be able to then come out in the limelight. Right. And then, you know, have your big day. So, so that's, that's sort of the big lesson of a marathon and it's, and you get, you, you get out of it, what you put in. Absolutely. <laughs> so Patrice, I little secret, I've done several as well. So I know exactly ah. what you're talking about. And yeah, you really do get out of it. And also there's no cheating that uh, miles that you put in because on the Absolutely. day you've either done them or you've not. Right? <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. In Chicago, you're so right. It's just really cool. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the next things we're going to have to answer just because of time. I wish we had forever, but you can just do this with a word or two. What's your favorite thing to cook? Do you have a favorite? Uh, peach pie. Peach pie. I love it. All right. You're also a seamstress or so something, and you've just opened an online store, really and truly. Okay. So what kind of stuff do you sew? Okay. Somebody wants um, to. Decorative throw pillows um, made from an African fabric called Ankara. It's common in West Africa and East Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. Um, so somebody yes, wants to that's... find you, what's the um, the website? Do you have a website they can order? Yes, I do. It's called Lara Threads. It's L-A-R-A. -A. It's it's part of my middle name, L-A-R-A -A, Threads. So it's only Dot com? Dot com, yes. Okay, because I'm going to be looking just as soon as we finish this interview. And others may want to as well. All right, lastly on this, what are you reading? What are your three favorite books? Oh, great. Um, okay, first, The Gene. The Gene. G-E-N-E. -E. -E -E, yes. I know what um, by Sid Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sid Siddhartha Mukherjee. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Um, second one, Americana um, by Chimamanda Adichie. She's a fabulous, just eminent Nigerian writer. Americana. Um, third one, I would say Cutting for Stone by Abraham Verghese. Fantastic. Highly recommend that. And if I may throw one more in, yes. um, State, State of Wonder um, by Ann Patchett. Just the title of that one makes me smile, doesn't it? State of Wonder. I love that. State of Wonder. It's, it's a beautiful book. Okay. Really amazing. I'm going to be writing you after this so I can get them in writing, okay, so that we can do that. Americana, State of Wonder, I've got it. All right, now, let's transition to Salem. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Wowza. All right, first to loosen up. What was your favorite course at Salem? And you can't say organic chemistry. French. Aha. <laughs> oh, we are standing. Okay, French, that was easy. Easy for yeah. you. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite tradition at Salem? Uh, fall Fest. Fall Fest. You liked it? I did too. I loved it. All right. Your favorite place on campus to go when you needed to get away and recharge or needed the, the quietest or prettiest or whatever place to recharge? Where did you go? My room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay then. <laughs> I, I had a single the whole time. So that you was, that was a place to go. And that's it. Yes. <laughs> All right, now, this, that's, that's really funny. One time I asked somebody um, about where do you go when you studied and needed to get away and study? And she just broke down laughing and she said, well, that's assuming I studied. <laughs> so I changed the way I worded that one. <laughs> I'm kidding. I did see that interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling. Yeah, you saw it already. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So right now at this point, it is very typical for me to ask what was Salem's secret sauce for you? but I'm gonna kind of rephrase that a bit, knowing a little bit more about you, okay? 
So you, you clearly had a little bit of an atypical college experience because when you came to Salem, you had just moved to the U.S. eight months before from Nigeria. So you just started and your first two years, you actually lived at home, I think. So you were trying to get used to a whole new country, a whole new environment, you know, living at home, not taking advantage of the social scene, all those things. And wow, that feels overwhelming to me even to think about. But clearly there was something about Salem and that you give a lot of credit to in terms of supporting your growth. So how would you say the Salem community supported that journey for you? And what did that time at Salem provide for you and your growth? Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, that, you know, I, I think thinking back, um, the gift that I got was the gift of time. Time, and I mean that by, by um, what I mean by that is time to figure things out, right? So I didn't feel the pressure, right, to be or act or do anything like my peers, right? I just did not, I didn't feel that. Um, so I could kind of focus on, again, taking in all, the, all of the, the stimuli that I was taking oh, in was so and different. figure things out. So the environment, um, the, the Salem really just was a place, I would say of freedom, right? I just, I felt free to, again, just figure things out, um, which not having the experience of going to another school, I don't know how it would have gone if I'd gone to a different school. Yeah. Um, but knowing what I know now about different types of institutions, um, I could imagine, you know, if I'd gone to a big state school or even just any larger institution, or I would say even a co-ed school, um, it might have been a very different experience. The adjustment period um, may have been a little bit more challenging for me, as challenging as it was. So I think what Salem gave me was that just just freedom to. Um, to exist and be me as I figure things out. <laughs> lovely, lovely. All right, so as we begin to draw to a close, which I really hate, you and I may have to consider doing this offline after we finish, but <laughs> as you think back to that young person at Salem with all the ideas and all the confusion and all the adjustment necessary and everything in your life back then, knowing now what you know, um, what would you tell that 18, 20, 21 year old student of today in terms of your own knowledge that you now have that perhaps could make their journey more fulfilling, rewarding their experience? What would you say? Um, oh boy, um, I, think, I think I would say maybe reach out more to that, that people are, are, are willing to help, right? People are willing to help, but um, if you ask, right? Um, and so that's that's probably the one thing I probably would have done a little bit differently. And you know, le letter to to my teenage self, yeah, maybe maybe talk to more people, right? Um, yeah, so other than that, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I enjoy the process enjoy and it gets better. It gets better. That's, yeah, it does get better, doesn't it? Because those can be really overwhelming times and for you especially, it had to have been. But Absolutely. I think the other thing, you know, about asking, to ask means you have to be vulnerable and you have to say yes. you don't know something. Yes. And that's hard yes. to do at 18 and 19 years old, isn't it? It is, it is, um, you know, the older I got, <laughs> the older I've gotten, the more, the more I've realized that first, hey, shock it, I don't know everything, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, right? And, and asking for help is, is and, I, and, I tell, and I tell some of my, my students that asking for help is a, it's a sign of wisdom that you know what you don't know. Oh, do you know that you don't know something? <laughs> right. right, you may not know what you don't know, but you know there's something missing here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. um, and, but you're right. Um, asking for help is puts you in a position of vulnerability and it's not an easy position to be in. Um, but what I would say again is trust that people are there for you. Right? And, they, and they understand that it may not be easy to ask for help and that people are generally good. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so you get the last word. You get to say what's on your mind, what you love to leave people with, what's your most important message for folks to take away. So it's all yours. What's your words of wisdom? Uh, my word of my words, you know, I, 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 I'm a firm believer in enjoying the journey. Um, have goals. Having goals is great, right? Um, have a destination. That's great. Um, but also enjoy the journey, you know, while you're working towards gold, enjoy the journey, look around, um, pay attention to what's going on. And that's, that's both, you know, metaphorically, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, and truly and, and actually, you know, take a walk, look around, um, enjoy, the, enjoy the journey. I think that's my big message is wherever, wherever you are in your path, um, take a look around um, and enjoy the journey. And because at the, you know, I feel like sometimes, especially if, you know, we have you know, different paths to take, um, you may not know where you're going to end up, right? But if you've taken the time to sort of enjoy the process, it, it may not even matter where you end up, right? So, Perfect example. Uh, um, so, so that's, that's something I've learned and that's something I try to live by and try to remind myself of that too, right? To enjoy the process. Yeah. What a beautiful way to end this. Um, I don't know how to say thank you, both for your time today, but really even much bigger than that for the contributions you make to our world and to all of those curious minds and the students that benefit from your amazing style to, um, I guess, share your knowledge and education with them. So just on behalf of the entire Salem community, if I can be bold enough to think I could speak for them, I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. And for all of us, we are really fortunate to have you as, as an alum of Salem. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. And again, thank you so much for having me for this. This has been just a wonderful time. I, I really enjoyed this um, and, you know, being part of the Salem community is so dear to me and and you know I I welcome the opportunity to you know, continue to be in touch and stay in touch and be involved as much as I can so thank you so Wonderful. much for this opportunity. We have you on speed dial we'll find you again <laughs> kidding. but really to all of our viewers I really hope you've enjoyed this half as much as I have no joke and I look forward to seeing you again in two more weeks with another episode of Salem Voices. Until then Oyenda and I are going to do a quick little countdown. You're ready, right? On three, and together we're going to say Salem Strong as our goodbye. So here we go on three. One, two, three. Salem Salem Strong. strong.